Uh, bye. Um, so I'm now going to introduce Frida, who many of who's been a member of the choir on and off for years, and a good friend to many of us. And um, we we thought that starting out the season to think about the right to live in peace, it made sense to listen to and learn more about the great peacemaker and how the peacemaker made peace in this land that has actually lasted for a thousand years. And that we hold the story of the peacemaker in our hearts as we move forward through this season, uh, looking at the ways that we, we may become peacemakers, but also what are the lessons from the great peacemakers. So Frida, where are you? Um, turning it over to Frida Jacques uh, and um, there you go. Thank you. So I'm what Duenine, Frida from Onondaga. And so I've been asked to talk about the peacemaker and our coming to peace very, very long time ago. So I always go right to the beginning of time when um, people, you know, or first or began here. We were given good ways to be. We were told to be loving and kind to one another. And we were given lessons on how to use the resources on earth, on mother earth. And there was a great deal of good, peaceful living for a very long time. After a while, there were a lot of people. So at that point in time, it was hard to tell who was related to who. So at that point, we were given uh, a way to have our clans. So then after that, there was a time where uh, a man was, well, a boy was amongst the village who gathered a bunch of other boys and started teaching them about our ceremonies. And so our ceremonies began way, way back. And those boys took that, the ceremonies that they had learned from this boy to the other villages. So that was developed way, way back. So after a very long time, our people began to forget their basic duties of being peaceful and being loving and kind to one another. And it became so that the cruelest and meanest men became the leaders. And it's often said that, you know, that it was nations were fighting with nations, but it's my basic understanding is that it just got extremely violent, so violent that there were groups of people here and there and that there were violent leaders who led them and um, there was lots of killing back and forth and lots of revenge killing. So it was a real horrible time to be living because it certainly wasn't a case of living in peace. So this was thousands of years later from thousands and thousands of years later after, you know, the beginning of time. So we did have a peaceful time where then it just really got all out of control. At that point in time, Creator decided to send um, someone to help bring a message of peace to our people. And this person we call the peacemaker and he was born on the other side of Ontario. And I always say the Bay of Quint. I don't know the French to say it right, but anyway, it's Q-U-I-N-T-E. And in that little bay is right on the other side of Ontario from like maybe Oswego. If you look north, you see what looks like uh, it's supposed to be an island, but it's connected. So it's sticking out. Anyway, that's where the Bay of Quint is. He was born to a woman who had no, no man. And the grandma, realizing that her daughter was um, pregnant, was very upset by this and wanted to be rid of the child when the child was born. And she made many attempts, but there were many miracles where she threw him in the freezing water and she went back to their home. And there he was sitting in his, her, his mother's uh, lap, you know, being held by his mother. Uh, there was, you know, she tried to be rid of him, uh, but she had a dream. And in that dream, she was told that there was a serious 
purpose for this child and that she should nurture it. And he had a message of peace to bring to, to the people. So this is the beginning. So he grew up there and his mom and his grandma took care of him and nurtured him so he could get to this point where he could cross Ontario. He decided to build a canoe and he made it out of stone, stone white canoe. And of course this, you know, is very shocking because neither you or I would make a canoe out of stone because of how it would sink pretty quick. But anyway, he crossed Ontario uh, in this canoe. And I imagine it was to get the attention he needed for people to listen to him. So he came across and he started traveling across um, the land and towards Onondaga. And he's eventually gonna go to the Mohawks who were actually situated up in Albany. Um, but on his way, he stopped at Onondaga. And here Onondaga was a whole other story that I think is very important. And it's um, Hayawenta who was Onondaga and he had daughters. Some say five daughters, some say seven daughters, but there's a man at Onondaga who wanted to marry his eldest and he refused him immediately because he didn't care for this man at all. The man just went about asking for the second daughter, was refused again and then asked for the third daughter and refused and perhaps the fourth or fifth daughter, this man was so angry and furious that he, he caused the death of his daughters. So this man lost his children in no time at all. And he had his head, his mind, his head and mind were on the ground with grief. He was just taken so badly with grief. He traveled down towards um, the lakes in Tully, Tully Lakes, which is just south of Onondaga, where Onondaga is now. And at near the Tully exit, there's this big mound of um, gravel there. And there's five little lakes beyond it. So he went there in the woods. And he started taking care of himself as a person in grave grief. And he thought about how he was as a human being and his physicality and how he was affected. And it was, his throat was raspy because he had cried so much and he could hardly speak. His ears were closed off. It was as if dust had flown in the air when his daughters were killed and covered his ears. He didn't notice if um, someone was trying to speak to him. He didn't notice if even the birds were singing. He didn't notice, he couldn't hear. And then his eyes were puffy and red from crying and he couldn't see clearly either. So these three items are often spoken about, but he had problems with his stomach. He had problems eating. He had other things happening with his body that he made note of. So he thought this was important. He decided to make little wampum strings, little strings of, of beads to represent each, each uh, part that he was thinking of so that he would remember. And one day he was reviewing them. And he would speak about each and put it down and speak about another one and put it down. And the peacemaker came along just about then. And he started listening to Hayawenta speaking about how he was so stricken by grief. And the peacemaker had great compassion for him. He just moved by this. So he took those strings and he went to him. And first he got a cup of wonderfully clear wonderful water, which there was plenty of then, and took that cup of water and had him drink it. And he asked the creator, peacemaker asked the creator to clear Hyawanta's throat so he might speak clearly again. Then he went to him with a feather and he reached over and he cleared his ears so that, and asked the creator to clear his hearing so he may, might hear everything around him again. And then he went to him with a soft, soft doe skin and he wiped his eyes. 
and ask the creator to clear his sight so he might see everything around him again. And he continued on with the other, other uh, beads where there was, there's 14 in this ceremony. So <clears throat> at the end of this, Hayawenta was able to stand and keep a good mind. He no longer carried the desire to have revenge. And so he was well. And the peacemaker asked him to come along with him as he headed up toward the Mohawks who were up near Cohos Falls. At Cohos Falls, there was a village on top of a cliff. There's a very large cliff and the falls are the rumbling kind that spread out. So it's a very huge and big falls. And on the north end is that cliff. So they approach this village that's on top of that cliff and they ask for the leadership. Say, take us to your leaders. We want to speak to them. And the warriors could care less. Who are these? They, they don't know who these people are. So who are these people? So they didn't bother. So they went to the edge of that precipice and the peacemaker climbed up a tree and then onto a limb. And as the warriors were watching this, he asked them to take that limb down with him on it. And of course they were happy to, they were accustomed to torturing people and hurting people and killing people. So this was nothing. So they got that limb off and he went flying into the gorge and they felt, well, that's, that's that. So they went back to their, their places and in the morning, who was waiting at the fire for them but the peacemaker and he was there. And so they hurried up and went and found their leadership because they felt no one could have survived that kind of fall. And uh, he was able to share the message of peace. That peace is active, you have to work at it. And a re he, they gave them a reminder that we have good minds to use. They perhaps had forgotten because they were so used to using the other side of things. They were so used to killing and hurting and hating and seeking revenge that they were probably not aware that all this time they had the ability to reach in and find the good mind and carry peace and, and a caring heart again. And it's my interpretation of all this that Hayawinta went, because he's evidence that it's true. You know, it's like one of the most horrible things to lose all your, all your children all at once. And um, the, how, how great that grief must have been. And he was evidence that here he is walking about peaceful, with a good mind, and able to help carry that message of peace. So that's what I see his, his part in all this was. And it took a long time while they were visiting the Mohawks, because the clans were there already, they set peace chiefs in, the ones they were able to convey the peace uh, message to, and put them in as, as chiefs for the bear and the turtle and the wolf. And then they went on and traveled to the Oneidas and shared the message of peace there. Um, and then they passed Onondaga because Onondaga had problems that they couldn't deal with right away. So they went to Cayuga and shared there. And the Senecas, they were a little troublesome, but they still went to the Senecas and shared the message of peace and then came back to Onondaga. Now Onondaga, there was Taradaho and Taradaho was super, super scary person who was totally used to killing, used to abusing women, used to uh, being in control of Onondaga. They knew that they had to get to him in order to help Onondaga come into the peace. So they made many, many efforts. And these efforts, it took a long time. They'd approach him from different ways. They went on on the Daga Lake and tried to approach him through the lake. And Taradaho was able to make the waves go up so that they couldn't pass with the canoe. They tried to come over the hill down towards him, uh, walking and coming over the hill to him. And he called all the snakes out. 
So the snakes came out and they had no, no desire to go any further because of these snakes in their way. And um, Taradaha was very powerful. Uh, in one of the stories that, that I was told, he could look in one direction and all the birds could just fall from the air and fall dead. So this man was a super powerful and uh, so they had to reach him and try to help him. And uh, it took a long time. And finally, there was a day where he could approach him. Um, I forgot to describe that he had snakes coming from his hair. Uh, and you know, that's, that's pretty scary, obviously the fact that he could survive this way. And anyway, uh, he was finally able to accept the peace. They went to him and combed the snakes from his hair. And that might be an analogy of healing him, helping him. And then um, he was willing to work for the peace. And because this was such a huge change in character, um, and also, it was also part of the deal. You will have a great deal of responsibility in this new piece. So his, his responsibility was to look out for all the five nations. It was five at that point. And that to help them keep together and be a support for, for all of them to watch them watch out for them. So this was his... Um, his duty given to him, Taradaho. So the first man who was put in this place was a pretty horrible man beforehand. And I think over time, it's easy to forget and we expect people to be perfect and really people are never perfect. And the fact that this man was convinced and able to reach into his good mind and use his good mind uh, for the people from that point on, you know, that's a real example of that healing can happen uh, and people can change and that access to the good mind is there with pretty much everybody. So that's a good lesson. Um, now, at that point in time, they could come together and they did this at Onondaga Lake. On the shores of Onondaga Lake, there was a great white pine tree and people gathered there because they knew they were all excited that the peace was be going to begin and the peacemaker was going to share the laws that went with the new peace, the constitution and how things would work. And um, I was told that Jagunsuse, who was one of the first people to hear the message of peace was there to place the um, deer castaway, uh, the deer, whatever you'd call it. it. It's what they wear on their head when they're a chief and it has the deer antlers. Anyway, she, she was one, she started that and, and did this to set the chiefs uh, in as chiefs of the Confederacy. Now it's a Confederacy. So the peacemaker went and had the warriors uplift that great white pine. And as that pine fell, there was a gaping hole where the roots had been. And in that hole was a, a stream running by under, underground. So he had the warriors throw their weapons into that hole and they brought that tree back up. So it was a real case of bearing your weapons. And there's, you can't find a stronger uh, symbol and action that means there'd be no more killing. And the peace would, would happen because the nations would work together. They'd work for themselves as, as they needed to, to help keep the peace in their own territories, but they would work together to help keep the peace amongst everyone and that they would all need one another as time goes by and that they wouldn't fall out of their um, relationships to one another. Uh, let's see. How am I doing in time? You're okay. Good. Okay. You have about, about five more minutes. Okay. Now, one of the ceremonies that happened after the peace um, 
was made was called Edge of the Wood Ceremony. And it was a ceremony that ha was held because, you know, the village is in a certain area, but there's like miles of, of open area around it where all the planting happened. And, and then there was the woods. And what would happen if another nation came to visit, you know, uh, say from the Senecas, they came, they went to the edge of the woods and they started a fire and people would see, oh, there's someone here, there's someone coming, let's go see. So they would meet them halfway. And then in the field, they would stop and they would help them. They, they'd greet them and they would like, there's this part where they take the brambles off of them because they've been through the woods for several days, you know? And, um, but one of the things that they always did was the three parts of the condolence that I just spoke about, clearing of the throat, clearing of the hearing, the ears, and the opening of the eyes. It was because it was that the condolence, part of a condolence, they're condoling these people. It's saying, I know since last we saw one another, you've had loss. And that recognition is important. And this is between nations. You have had loss and we have had loss. So it's this condoling of one another before we begin anything else. And I like believe it's a reminder that we don't want to ever go to that place where we're killing one another again, because we already have heartache from the losses we have as things are, as humans come and go. So, I think it's an important, that's an important lesson. And I don't know, I don't think there's anything comparable out there. There might be in some, you know, other cultures, um, but I've yet to see nations stop and recognize loss. Mm -hmm. I think it's an important thing. Um, and may I take a moment to speak about the Columbus the circle thing? Yes, it's, it's, your, it's your, your time. I got three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I have this wonderful idea and I'd like to push it. And it's really not about getting rid of Columbus and, and the statue. You know, people are there, they're doing it. So we'll let them. I would like to see a huge globe, maybe made out of reused plastic, but clear, very much like a crystal globe with the shapes of the continents and the, and, the, and the different countries in it, like a giant globe. Mm. And from each country where someone has come to Syracuse, there's a flag, a colorful one, so they can recognize it, sticking out of the earth right where they came from. And there would be one for each kind of person who has come to this territory to live. And it would be, you know, that recognition as people come, they can add them. And I don't know if we ever notice if people actually leave, but I suppose we could remove one. But I'm thinking that it would be a way of recognizing all the people that have come here in a nice positive way. So that's, that's I'm pushing that idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm done. Right. Thank you for your, so we, we now have a, a few minutes for comments, thoughts, uh, questions before we, we kind of take a time for each of us to think about what the story of, or the, the journey of the great peacemaker means to us. Um, I, I'll just start with a comment about meeting at the edge of the woods. I feel like uh, that process of hearing someone's grief, uh, that's one of the most important ways that we recognize each other as human. That's what you're saying. But I think that it's a deep, a very deep way to, um, to, to kind of make firm the idea that I, once I see your grief, I can't hurt you anymore. <laughs> it makes sense inside of my heart. Once I see that you're a person who's, who's lost their baby or who's hurting or something. So I, I love that idea. And I, like to think about how that might 
work in the world. So anyway, comments, thoughts, nothing, everything's important. <laughs> I would love, I would just, thanks for the love and maybe I hear it again, but I'm hearing it always. Thank you so much. I love you. Thank you. Say, say your name, Karen. Karen Kearney. Karen K. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, Lisa raised their hand. You want to jump in, Lisa, and then we've got Ellen in the chat. Mm -hmm. Sigali Frida. Hey. It's, Hi, always, Lisa. it's always so good to see Frida, and I've seen a chance to listen, and um, I always get something new whenever I, I hear you speak. And the one thing that stood out was that um, peace is something that we have to, or the good mind is something that we have to work at. And it's it's constantly having to work at it. And, you know, um, there are sometimes, you know, coming out of my sickness, or there is sometimes that I do fall and I pick myself right back up and I'm like, I am grateful every moment. And so I just wanted to share that with you, Frida. And um, I don't know if anyone knows, but Frida is like an auntie to me because I've known her since I was a little kid and um, I've always looked up to her. So just seeing her puts me in this, um, this state of peace and and remembering that um, that we have these lessons that we grew up with and everything we need to know, um, Frida and um, all the other clan mothers and aunties and my mom and, and, and folks of that era helped make us who we are and, and it is appreciated and we are following everything you taught us. And so I just wanna make sure that you you know how appreciated and loved you are. So yeah, we'll go Frida. So good to hear. So now Carolyn and Michael raised their hand. At least we, yep, we're not muted. Hi, everybody. Um, Frida, at, at this particular moment on the planet, at this particular time, I have always been proud to come from a land whose original people were so wise. And I just feel like I needed to hear that message of peace and the whole world needs to hear it. And that would be my hope that somehow that would be some great day. But right now I find myself wanting to talk about peace, but my thoughts of Ukraine are very troubled. So thank you for that message. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You can ride with me if you want to get something in there. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're set. I think one of the differences in culture is that we really believe we are connected to that good mind, you know, because we're reminded that we have a good mind to use. And I think some folks out there in the world uh, don't believe that. It's somehow being bad is normal <laughs> and it's okay. And I think that can get in the way of trying to keep peace. Yeah. It's sad that it can be, somebody can act like such a bully on such a high scale and, and kill so many people and, and seems to be all about ego. I'm not sure what it's about exactly, but it's, it's pretty, pretty ugly, you know? And you have to recognize the ugliness. And it's too bad he's not allowing his people to see what's really going on. And get the snakes out of his hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have a question in the chat from Ellen. Can you say any more of how the peacemaker was able to turn the Tadadaho's heart and mind? I think part of it is this the peacemaker himself as he carried himself. In that very long story, I forgot to tell you that it's a very long story and it's not this 10, 20 minute thing. <laughs> so in part of the story, uh, the peacemaker actually looks into a smoke hole of somebody's home 
And the fella in that home happens to be a cannibal and he is stirring a pot with a human in it. So this is how far off they got, right? This, this guy is a cannibal. So he peeks in the smoke hole and the reflection of himself is in the soup. And this man looks at this amazing looking man and goes, I can't be doing this when if I look like that kind of reaction. So this is only one part where and eventually, you know, he spoke to him about how this isn't what you, this is what you eat. You go, go and see and hunt, let's go hunt for a deer. And at, when they found the deer, they thanked the deer and he showed them that he needed to be thankful and show the thanksgiving to the, to the deer. And they brought the deer home and cooked it, whatever. Um, but that shows you just the power of someone who carries peace and a good mind and a good heart with them that they can affect others around them. And I think that had a great deal to do with them affecting um, uh, Taradaho. And they did approach him many times. So he knew the peace was coming. And, you know, he, he would hear little bits and pieces of it and see people changing. And uh, it, it took a long time, but eventually he was willing to accept the peace. Yeah, and they say, here's, here's a good thing for a Mother's Day thing since it's a couple days after. The story I heard was why he was such a terrible person was because his mom did not take care of him well, didn't pay attention to him, didn't listen to him, didn't, didn't um, show him a loving, kind way. And because of this, he, he turned out the way he did, where he was bitter and angry and able to hurt people and, and be like that. So mothers have such an important job to do to show people how to be loving, how to be caring and comfort them and be with them so that they can develop their own ability to show love and compassion. So that was an extra treat there. <laughs> this is Karen, just wanted to say, hi Maureen, glad you're here. <laughs> um, do you wanna just say that, I mentioned that there's the, the role of Tadadaho is still happening today. That oh yeah, we have a Taradaho now. Taradaho became, um, you know, a, a leader for all the five nations. But when he passes, just like with a chief in a, in a clan, he's replaced by another one, another person to hold those same responsibilities. So uh, Taradaho, who we call, you know, his English name is Sid Hill. Um, he has that duty now for this time. And prior to him was Leon Shenandoah, who many people knew. Yeah. Um, I feel like we're kind of at the end of the comment and questions, but we will have some time to be with each other in small groups to, to reflect. Um, uh, while we're moving to our groups, we're going to play a little impromptu uh, video that what we did as a choir singing, um, what's the name of it? Peace Like a River. Uh, I think it was right after Trump was elected. And it was something that we did to kind of, like I liked what Lisa said, are you still here Lisa? About the practice of working on a good mind, the practice of being a peacemaker. It's, it's, we have to work at it. We have to remember it. I, it's really important to me. Can't just say peace or whatever, you know, <laughs> okay. So as we move into our groups, we'll hear the choir or watch the choir sing a little of this song. And um, we'll meet back here in a, about 10, 15 minutes, I guess, to either make comments or ask another question or whatever comes up for you in the group. Um, so anyone have anything particularly potent you wanna share? And I, I would like to start with anyone who hasn't shared anything yet. I do see you, Carolyn and Michael. And I love you. <laughs> but is Michael there anything you'd like to share first? Michael doesn't share like I share. Michael can be separate from me. That's true. Okay, <laughs> Michael, go for it. 
Um, so the important message for today that I got from Frida's talk was that being a spokesperson for peace, being a voice for peace, a person can be powerful and can make a big difference. Mm. He has had his say. Okay, good. That's a good point. Anyone else? I guess. Yeah, jump in. I, I guess I would um, go with that because we were discussing in our group sort of the, the power of one person versus the collective or the system. And also the fact that it's not all about one person. It's not just one evil person. It's, and, but I, I, I think from what Michael was saying, one of the things that I really want to say and that Frida is such a great illustration of is that we can't do everything, but we can do what little piece we can. And speaking about this and bringing the story in and raising this idea up um, that partly that people can change, but there's so many pieces to the story. Um, you know, that is a huge, important, powerful um, piece that strengthens all of us. Thank you, Diane. So thank you, Frida. It's like planting seeds, mm -hmm. planting ideas. And I do enjoy it. And it is something I can do. <laughs> You're kind of magical, Frida. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Joan. Well, there is a lot of wisdom in, in Frida, that's for sure. I, uh, I'm, I'm imp really impressed that for thousands of years, um, the nations fought and then, you know, how many thousands of years since then they've lived in peace. Mm -hmm. That's a long, <laughs> think about how long that is when, you know, every 25 years we have a new war. Yeah. And, you know. Less than that. Yeah. So it's, I think it's, we were talking about the good mind, you know, and having you always have to come back to the good mind, always return, keep returning yourself to the good mind. Yeah. Thank you, Frida. You're welcome. Folks, feel free to keep jumping in. Okay, I'm going to take another turn then. Go for Frida, it. my group really, re this is Carolyn, sorry. Um, my group really, really liked your idea of this huge transparent map globe thing. We, we, yeah. we want to make it happen. <laughs> we were talking about it. I'd love it. Yes. I'd like to know if anyone knows, is there someone who, I'm thinking like, what, well, you know, if somebody was totally against it, now who, who that would be, I don't know. But if it was a crystal bowl ball, it could be easily broken, but in a tech, but maybe we could find a company that can make a redo plastic. So it's clear like crystal, as close as you can get and make it make that shape so that no matter how much they pound on it, it'll still be okay. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> There, there's bound to be some company able to do that, don't you think? Because my mind first went to Corning, you know, the glassware. But then that'd be $40,000. But maybe if they use the bottles that we all turn in and to make it, then maybe it won't be so expensive. But also, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt the earth. And also nobody could do it in so quickly. It's an idea. Mm -hmm. I, it is Karen. Um, a, a couple important things from our group. One was the appreciation of noticing the grief in other people, 
that was really important to one of us and the humanity of that. And then the, the persistence of the peacemaker to keep on going, even though there, even though he got thrown over into the water, all these, and I want the two, the two of them, like that's a, that's an important message for me when I feel like something that I'm doing isn't, you know, isn't working. It's like they, they just kept doing it. He kept doing it. And then the practice, like you said, uh, Lisa, that was really important for me too. Like the practice of silencing and going deep and noticing our mind and whatever that, like it just doesn't happen. None of this just doesn't happen. We have to do it. Keep coming back to ourselves, but also having the courage to, to, to keep going. Both of those were, resonated with us. Those are Frida's words. I just rephrased them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Frida. Yeah. I so, mentioned in my group that I like the idea of transforming from a hate monger to a peacemaker. That it's possible. Yes, that it's possible. Yeah. It's easy to forget that. It's really easy to demand that everybody be perfect. Yeah. And you know yeah. darn well nobody is, right? Right. Oh, true. And I think that needs recognition. When somebody has turned themselves around and are now being kind and loving and working on good projects in their life and stuff, stop and notice, stop and mention it. Oh, I'm so glad you're working on this now. It's such a good thing to see you out here doing that, you know, so that they get that encouragement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we all need yeah. encouragement at times. Yeah. Yeah, it would be nice if the culture also helped people to make that kind of transformation instead of just like promoting war. Yeah. And separation from each other and nature and the earth. But that's a whole other topic. <laughs> we could go into that someday. Yeah. We can go into those environmental rules that we were given at the beginning of time that, you know, People see as too simple to talk about, but I think it's worth talking about. Yeah. So maybe maybe when we get to that time of year where we're looking at environment more, we can do that. Okay, it's not, okay. a, not a long thing. So you know what? I gotta go let the cats in and feed them before it's too dark. So if you don't mind. Well, I'll let's go. just for a moment, then let's just stop and do some appreciations before you go, Frida. That's our and then we'll do announcements. People have been appreciating you, but if there's anybody else who has something they want to say. Thank you so much, Frida. I, I never heard that. I know we didn't hear the whole story, but that's more of the story than I've heard in the past. Thanks so much. Thank you, Barb. I second that, Frida. Okay, great, Christian. By the way, that I really enjoy that quilt. I'm glad. It was fun working on it. Kind of made me wish I had more to work on. Well, <laughs> come into my mind that maybe I should start making squares so we can make the next one. All right. <clears throat> but life has been so busy that I haven't had any time. I got plenty of scraps though, so I'm good in that shape. That place. I just want to appreciate um, our long relationship, our personal relationship, Frida and and with Ada and also your relationship to the choir. You've been such an important part of our story for many, many years. And um, I'm just grateful for that. So thank you. Well, I'm thankful for all my choir friends. Mm -hmm. Frida is coming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's a song they, they sing and it's um, freedom is coming. <laughs> Change the word to Frida is coming. And it's so cute. I love it. It is fun. Anybody else got something else they want to say before we Frida goes to feed her cat, Steve? Uh, yes, Frida. That was uh, uh, not just uh, excellently uh, complete, complete enough in the time, 
but you hardly said um at all. <laughs> so um uh, counters would be pleased. <laughs> it's very nicely done. Thank you. That it's mm -hmm. been years that I've been teaching like this, you know, so I have had a lot of practice. So I'm glad I don't do um every. <laughs> Thank you for noticing. Oh, Frida, I just want to thank you again and say that. And we talked about a lot of the things that uh, were mentioned already, but I want to say also that you left me wanting to know more. So hopefully there can be more someday. We have that nation to nation book through um, Neighbors of Onondaga Nation. There's a nice bibliography at the end that you could use to, for different readings about Native people in general, as well as Haudenosaunee people. And that you can find at the Syracuse Peace Council site. Look for new What's the name of that book? Nation to Nation. They're actually going to be working on a new one, I heard. Yeah. And you read, can read it quite well on the computer, I noticed. You know, yeah. the pages go by well. It's nice big letters. It's not teeny tiny. So. Oh, thank you. I was able to go to the uh, museum a few months ago. And if if anyone has not been there, they really should go. The one out on the on Dugga Lake Parkway. And of course, Frida, you're one of the teachers for that too. But that's, uh, if anybody hasn't been there, I think they should go. The Scano Center. Scano Great Law Peace Center, yeah. Which the OHA is heavily involved with. Yes. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming, Frida, and sharing you, your Allison. wisdom thank and you. fantastic umless storytelling. <laughs> <laughs> awesome.